Hello and welcome back to Principles of Accounting One. I am still your host, Dr. B. Appreciate all of you and all of your support over the past week. Uh, feeling much better. Still have a slight cough, but you know how that goes. Um, happy to to be with all of you in this 14th week of the semester. I uh, Wow, we, we went through a lot together uh, this semester, as you know. We've made it all the way to the 14th week. Uh, There's really only this week and next week to get through. The course officially ends on the 29th, which is next Saturday. Not this coming, but the following, yes? The 29th is the last day of the semester. What that means is uh, all of your work needs to be done by the 29th, with the exception of the final exam. Final exam needs to be done, I think it's, I think in the calendar we have May 5th. May 2nd, May 2nd for the final exam. Uh, I'm talking about the future, of course, right? Uh, that's, that's what we do in accounting as we talk about past, present, future. And, and speaking of which, uh, I would like uh, your, your classmate, uh, Ms. Maxine Mills, to, to talk to you all a little bit about the experience of working ahead and what that was like, because uh, Miss Mills finished the entire course already, um, and and I, I just want uh, her to talk to you a little bit about what the experience was like and, and uh, your overall perception of of what's to come. So, so Miss Mills, please. Yeah. So um, honestly, in the beginning, like when we first started the class, you were asking people about their experience, and I had explained that um, I had a background in operations management and in doing that, I, you know, you you do books, you do accounts payable, accounts receivables, um, keeping and that sort of stuff. I'm not an accountant by any trade, but uh, just being in a management position overall for quite extensively throughout my career, you do the uh, books for any business that you're managing and operating. And even though that had been my background, it had been more than a decade <laughs> since I was in that capacity. So initially in the beginning, I was a bit rusty. I would, you know, join study groups and say, oh, I really don't understand this or I don't understand this. And, you know, you and I have had conversations where the, I thought or or from what I remember that I was doing, I thought the process was one thing and it was something else. And over time, I just learned to relax and go through all of my study aids and then it just clicked over time um i also have a colleague at work who i would run my um you know my coursework by and say this is what i think it is so i found um a couple of information resources to help me just kind of say you know how you think you have it right but you're not 100 percent certain and you might say to somebody i want a second set of eyes because you and i have talked about um just the importance of the subtle nuances in the way that wording might occur with a problem or something to that degree. And once I was able to get the hang of that, I felt confident enough to just say, I'm just going to keep rolling along. Every time I submitted something, um, when my answers were like, all right, or something like that, I was like, oh, okay, I really know what I'm doing here. And it just began to like flood back and flood back and flood back. And I just felt confident enough to come all the way through. Now, I am going to tell you that I loved your lectures very, very, very much because you do explain things exceptionally well. And I had to get out of my own head and say, you know, again, just because I thought it was X, Y, and Z, just tune into the lectures. And so (laughs) you get a better explanation as to what your perspective on it was. So between the lectures and um, just the the book itself, the book is really also very self-explanatory. Like it was a great course material. I really enjoyed that. Um, And so between all of the information resources, between yourself as a lecturer and the book, I really felt very confident. But I will admit this, I had my final sitting in the queue for two weeks. I went back at that thing and I looked and it was like, I don't know, I don't know. And then I was like, just pull the trigger. You're you're doing well in the class. Um, and there were some, there were a couple of responses that I was like, okay, I'm still not a hundred percent certain on this. Sure. But then I said, you know what? You never know. And 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 I know that 
some of the study techniques that I've learned in other classes that nine times out of 10 and true or false, they say uh, most of those answers are actually true. So I went with that with a couple. Um, yeah. just, to, just overall enjoyed the class. You're actually one of the best professors that I've had this semester, to be honest with you. Um, I appreciate you saying that. It's just been, yeah, I felt that, you know, what I felt about you personally is that, and I said this to my education coordinator as well, too, that, um, and I did have a question for you or I needed something for you. Even if we may have had a different perspective, you were very kind and very respectful to me. And I have not had that type of feedback throughout all of my courses this year. So this was actually, I don't have favorites of anything, but if I had a favorite, I would say you're right up there, your tops with me. Thank you. This has been a wonderful experience. Thank you. So I appreciate you. Thank you so much, Ms. Mills. I, I really appreciate you saying that. Uh, it, it's it's been a uh, an honor and a pleasure uh, to be your professor this for this course. Uh, and that goes for all of you. I've I've had a, an absolute uh, blast being here, and I hope that you all did as well. Um, and uh, a lot of things that Ms. Mills just talked about are I uh, hopefully you all had a chance to listen to very closely because. Uh, Ms. Mills successfully completed the entire course already, uh, worked, worked ahead, uh, completed all the work for this week, next week, and even took the final exam, uh, and did very well, I, I might add. Um, and so uh, I want you all to think about that, think about uh, everything that Ms. Mills just talked about, and, and really um, think about it. Think about working ahead, thinking about pacing yourself. Uh, and I see a, lot, a few of you have done that, and I I, uh, I, I admire uh, your tenacity uh, and, and your um, forward thinkingness about working ahead, and and that to me that's uh, that shows signs of leadership, and uh, and that's why I wanted you to talk about that, Miss Mills, because that you've demonstrated that leadership ability in this course. So and I I sincerely appreciate that. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> it's my pleasure. And, 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 I, and I know a lot of you uh, in this course are you know, working professionals uh, with, with both Aon and, and, and any other careers you might have at this time. And, um, and also, of course, a lot of you are, are full-time parents as well. Uh, so I, that, that has not escaped my mind. And I want to say that I'm especially proud of all of you for uh, working through this course and your other courses, and then, of course, family and work and all the other life responsibilities that you have. So uh, I commend all of you for your, for your hard work. So thank you so much. Don't, uh, don't stop now. We're not done. Uh, but but also think about working ahead because I, um, I think that that's beneficial to you as well. Okay, uh, I, I, I'm step off the soapbox. Um, let's talk briefly about where we are in the classroom. Week 14, we're, we're going to talk about long-term liabilities today uh, and what we call debt financing. And then next week, we got two chapters to get through. I know it sounds like a lot. It's not that bad. Uh, the Chapter 16 is super short. Uh, 15 is as well, so uh, that'll be... That won't be a terrible class. It might be a little bit longer than we expect it to, but it won't be that bad, I promise. Uh, so you'll notice the due dates, right? So, of course, for this chapter, it's due on Sunday night, just as it always is. Next week, we got two things due, 15 and 16 quiz. Ooh, I know, sorry. Um, that, that's what all, one of the other reasons why I'm recommending working ahead, because, and you'll notice they're not, they're due on uh, Saturday, uh, April 29th. That's the last day of the semester. Um, so that's why everything's due by then. Okay, so if for whatever reason you still owe something from the past, maybe you didn't get a chance to finish uh, last week's work, you want to make sure that all of your late work and all of your future work are all submitted by next Saturday. That's I can't accept anything past that date. That's uh, university policy dictates that I cannot accept anything past the last day of the semester, and so we will follow that policy. Uh, if you need any help getting the stuff done, please reach out to me. I'll be happy to work with you. Um, it's super important to me that you're successful in this course, and that's one of the ways that I can help you in that process. 
Any questions so far before we jump into today's lecture? Okay, let's do this thing. Let's talk about long-term liabilities. Uh, now, we've talked a lot about the accounting equation. Who can remind me what that accounting equation is? Now you know this. What is the accounting equation? Come on now. Don't answer all at once. What is the accounting equation? Starts with assets. Tell me, Damon. The liability uh, equals... Uh, well, no, no. Assets equals liability. Is it plus yes. equity? Plus equity. You got it, Damon. Absolutely. Very well done. Assets equals liabilities plus equity. Long-term liabilities, which is what we're talking about today, is, of course, a liability. What is a liability? You can tell me. What is a liability? Oh, you remember something that you owe to somebody? Yeah, exactly, Damon. You know, it's it's what you owe to someone else. What the business owes to someone else. So, a long term liability, a liability that is greater than twelve months. The word long term means greater than twelve months. That's the accounting version of long term. Anything greater than 12 months is considered to be long-term. So today we're going to talk about long-term liabilities. More specifically, we're going to talk about what we call debt financing. Debt financing is a way for businesses to raise capital, cash, okay, cash assets. It's a way for companies to raise cash through a concept called financing. Financing is where the company either takes out loans from the bank, long-term liabilities, or issues what we call stocks and bonds. Stocks represent a percentage of ownership in the company. You all might be stockholders and not think of yourself as a stockholder. If you have a 401k or some other retirement vehicle, like a 403b or a Roth IRA or an IRA, you probably have some kind of stocks in there. It might be individual stock. Uh, individual stocks, or they might be in what we call, um, what's the name escaping me at the moment, they might be in what we call a mutual fund. A mutual fund is a portfolio, a lot of individual stocks, okay? Companies raise money, cash. By issuing stocks and bonds, in addition to taking out know, bank loans, both of these things together, we call that debt financing. It's called debt financing because the company has to pay that back eventually. The company has to pay back the loans it took out from the bank. Whether it's monthly payments, semi-annual, annual payments, whatever, the company's got to pay that money back. It's a loan. When it comes to stocks or bonds, the way that works is that the company is selling off shares of ownership in the company. A share of ownership represents a percentage owned by an individual that holds the stock. For example, I have a couple of shares of stock in Starbucks. One of my favorite coffee companies. And 
my shares represent a very small percentage, very small percentage, of ownership in Starbucks. What that means is, for every share of stock that I hold, I own a piece of the company. It's a very small piece. It's not worth a whole lot. But sometimes they pay what's called a dividend. It represents my ownership in the company. It's kind of the way that they pay me back. We're going to talk about all these kinds of things today. Because it's important for you to know how a company raises funds. How, where do they get all that cash to get started with? Right? Sometimes people wonder these things. These are the things we're going to talk about. It's called debt financing. So first, let's talk about those stocks and bonds that I've referred to earlier. A bond represents... i to put this... Uh, Interestingly, a bond represents a larger percentage of ownership in a company. It's kind of like a private loan, in a way. Corporations and governments issue bonds in order to attract a uh, Cash investment up front. Over the life of that bond, the company will repay it plus interest. That's the concept behind a bond. It's almost like a private individual holding a loan for this company or for the government. The government pay you back over time with some interest. That's what a bond is. Okay, That's why they call it a bond. It's a relationship right, between the company and the individual. It's a bond. That's where the name comes from. This slide kind of sums it up for us uh, in a very logical way. The bond really represents um, that that vehicle. I want you to, uh, to look at this formula for interest payments. Okay. The bond that you hold for a company or for the, a government agency is kind of like a loan, as I had said. The company pays you back the plus interest. The interest payment is calculated in a very specific way. It's what we call the bond par value, also known as the face value of the bond, times the contract interest rate, also known as an interest rate, Times time. The par value might be, we'll say, $1,000. The interest rate might be 10%. 10% okay? of $1,000, that's not a whole lot. About 100 bucks, right? Times time. It could be 90 days, but if it's long term, it might be 365 days. Uh, that's how we calculate the interest payment that you would receive every month or every six months or every year over the life of the bond. So that, that formula is going to be somewhat important here in the future. That's a reason why a company might issue a bond. It has advantages and disadvantages. Advantages are it doesn't affect ownership. A bond is not the same as a stock. A stock is a form of ownership in the company. A bond is like a almost like a personal loan, if you will, between the company and the individual. So there's no ownership control there. The bondholder, the person who has possession of the bond, doesn't have any ownership over the company. 
the interest that is paid on the bonds from the company to the bondholder is tax deductible. That's a nice benefit. Bonds can increase return on equity for the company. Those are the advantages of a bond. The disadvantages is that the bonds require payments of both interest and its face value back over time at the point of maturity. The word maturity means at the point in which the bond is due in full. The word maturity means it's the time in which it is due in full. It's when it matures. When it's due. That's a nice fancy way of saying when it's due. So the way it works is that the company pays the bondholder interest periodically. It could be a, every month, every six months, every year, whatever. So they pay the interest rate out to the bondholder, and then at the end of the bond, receive the whole face value back. So if you have a $1,000 bond with me, I'm going to pay you $10 every six months. That's the interest rate. And then at the end of the bond life, let's say it's for one year, I'll give you $1,000. So now I've given you $1,020 over the life of the bond. The reason why it's a disadvantage for the company is that they have to keep paying that interest and then the whole lump sum at the end of the, the bond. That can put strain on the company's cash flow. That's why it's a disadvantage. And bonds can decrease the return on equity over time. It's a possibility. This is what a bond looks like. Uh, there's usually a number associated with it. The company's name... Uh, the top right, person's name that the bond the, of the bondholder in the middle. That's usually signed. There's a mature. There's always going to be an a face value, a maturity date, and the interest rate expressed. Those are the primary things that a bond would would have. Bonds can be bought and sold. In what we call bond markets. If you've ever Listen to like uh, CNBC or or MSN or uh, one of the other money market channels, or or maybe you've seen something in the news about bond markets and always wondered what it was. Bonds can be bought and sold similar to stocks, but in what we call a bond market. The bond markets are very similar to stocks, and they have, um, it's basically a mechanism for people to buy and sell bonds. Now, the reason why you would, you might sell a bond or buy a bond using the bond market is based off of the interest rate or based off of its face value based off of what we call a discount rate. And we're going to talk about those things. In accounting, since this is more financial accounting than managerial, we record these types of transactions using journal entries. We usually do it at the end of the accounting period. It's like an adjusting entry, if you will. We do this for both the bond uh, issuance and all the interest that we pay. So here we have, at the end of the year, I recorded the sale of a bond. The company issued a bond for $100,000. I sold the bond for $100,000. I got $100,000 of cash coming into the company. So I debit cash, $100,000. And then I credit account called bonds payable 100,000 
Now, he, remember, since we're talking about long-term liabilities, I got to repay that bond. It's like a remember, it's like a personal loan to the company. So because I got to repay it, it's a liability. Went to this account called bonds payable. That liability account. So here we have some information. The face value is a hundred thousand. The interest rate on this bond is eight percent. I need to pay interest payments semi annually. That means twice per year. At the halfway mark and at the end of the year. On the thirtieth of June. And December 31. I make my two interest payments. The bond is good for two years. It's the life of the bond, two years. Makes it long term. It's greater than a year. Pay interest on it twice at 8%. It's 8% of the face value, right? So, but I remember that formula we talked about earlier. The formula was the interest rate, well, the face value, 100000 times the interest rate, 8%, times time. The time here represents the time in which we pay the interest. Because we pay the interest every six months, it's half a year is the time, you see? So, base value, 100000 The interest rate is 8%. Pay interest every six months, so half a year is the time part. So, one half for time. This means that every six months, we pay an interest payment of $4,000. On June 30, the entry I make is debit, Bond interest expense, expense account, $4,000, and credit cash, $4,000, to represent the payment of the interest I'm making to the bondholder. I make this same entry every six months for a period of two years. Make sense? Doing so well so far? Okay. Great, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Chiquita. Okay. Now, at the end of the bond, when the bond's maturity date arrives, I need to repay the entire face value of that bond. And the way I do that is I debit bonds payable, 100000 That reduces the total payable. And I credit cash, 100000 Shows me repaying the principal of the bond. Very straightforward transaction. Bonds are relatively easier to calculate than stocks are in a general sense. Bonds are very predictable. Stocks are not so much. <laughs> now, earlier we talked about this idea called the bond market. The bond markets where we can buy or sell bonds um, based off the interest rate, the market rate. So, I can either sell my bond or buy my bond at a discount or at a premium. Here's the definition of these two terms. A discount is when I sell the bond less than the market value. I sell the bond for less than the market value. If I have a $100,000 bond, I might sell that bond for $90,000. That's called a selling it at a discount rate. Okay. The reason why I would do that 
is because instead of paying interest every six months, I would pay out at a I would just repay the whole hundred thousand at the end of the bond, you see. That's why we call it a discount rate. I'll talk I'll get into a little bit more detail. The word premium means I'm selling the bond at a higher rate than the market. If I have a hundred thousand dollar bond, I might sell it for a hundred and ten thousand dollars. Okay, that's higher than the market rate. Therefore, I'm selling it at a premium. The reason why I might sell it at a premium is because instead of uh, repaying the hundred thousand at the end of the maturity, I'll repay the hundred thousand, then ten thousand dollars worth of interest. Okay, I'll break it down for you a little bit further, but that's the concept of when you hear discount, think selling below market rate. You hear premium, we're selling above the market rate. In order to figure out the calculation, bond premiums, discounts, we use an amortization schedule. For those of you who work in the insurance business, you might have heard something about an amortization schedule before. The concept derives from looking at some ch charts, identifying what is the interest rate, or the discount rate in some cases. So we're going to look at amortization of a bond discount using what we call the straight line method. Here we have a discount bond. Its face value is $100,000. I sold that bond for $96,400. Translates to 96.4% of the par value, meaning I sold it at a discount. The stated interest rate on this bond is 8%. The market interest rate is 10%. This means selling the bond at a discount. When I sell a bond for less than the market rate, it's considered a discount. I pay interest on this bond on the June 30, December 31 of every year for a period of two years. If the bond is two years. So let me show you how we calculate the interest payment. First, let's start with receipt of the bond cash. I sold the bond. The buyer paid me for the bond. Record it like this. Debit cash, 96400 The reason why not for the whole 100000 is because I sold it at a discount. So I sold it for 96.4% of the face value. I got cash in, $96,400. There's a new account that maybe you haven't heard about yet. It's called the Discount on Bonds Payable. Discount on Bonds Payable. This is what we call a contra liability account. You may remember a time where I told you about this concept called contra low accounts. This is typically things like accounts payable and accounts receivable. They go up and down, right? Depending on what's going on. Accounts payable goes up when I receive bills. 
It goes down when I pay them. Accounts receivable goes up when I make sales on credit or on account. And it goes down when my customers pay me. The contra flow accounts. Contra liability account works the same way. Okay. Instead of the contra liability account going up and down, what it does is it contradicts, contradicts, contra con- contrasts, I think that's a word, against the liability account. That's why we're debiting it instead of crediting it. Okay. This count on bonds payable is debited. It's contradictory of the liability account, the bonds payable. Okay. But discount on the bonds payable, we debit it 3600 in this example. How we got to that discount amount, we take the face value minus the cash that we got in. And then we credit bonds payable of 100000 The reason for this is because eventually we're going to pay a full $100,000 back to the buyer. But instead of doing it through what we call standard ish, uh, standard uh, interest payments, getting the interest payments to equal the face value. right? And that's why it's a discount. The uh, interest payments. Uh, let's let's take a look. Interest payments. We pay them uh, twice a year for a period of two years, so four payments total. Face value, as we said, is a hundred thousand. That's paid at maturity. Discount value is ninety six thousand four hundred. So, uh, looking at the interest payments, the way we calculate the interest payment does not change. When it comes to calculating the principal, so we take the face value, hundred thousand, times eight percent interest, times time, half, because we make the payment every six months. If I multiply that by the four payments, so times that times four is sixteen thousand. That's every six months I pay four thousand dollars. Thousand times four is sixteen thousand. Add in the discount. The reason why I add in the discount is because paying in the interest sixteen thousand. Add in the discount of three thousand six hundred, which means my total interest expense is nineteen thousand six hundred dollars. We're not done yet. The total bond interest expense is not going to be nineteen thousand six hundred dollars. Nineteen thousand six hundred dollars divided by the four payments means the new interest payment for six months is $4,900. You'll notice that if I pay $4,900 every six months for two years, we're going to find our way back to $100,000. That's what we're getting at. So we debit bond interest expense $4,900. Credit the discount on bonds payable by nine hundred dollars. Oh, we got the nine hundred. It's the discount divided by the number of periods. The credit cash four thousand dollars shows us repaying the interest amount of four thousand dollars every six months. I know it's relatively complex. Uh, uh, it's. If you think about a discount, where we work our way back to that face value, 
I would like you to think about it. You see, when we issued the bond, we received 90, 96400 in cash. To rise the discount over time, you'll notice that when I make my interest payments, I'm getting my way back to 100,000. Know? That's the concept behind amortization using discount bonds. It's relatively complex, but I, I tried my best to explain it in the Clearest way possible. Are there any questions on the amortization or how discount bonds work? Don't worry. I'm, you won't be doing anything crazy on the final when it comes to stuff like that. Now let's talk about bond premiums using the same method for paying out interest. Remember, the bond premium is when I sell the bond a greater value in the market. So if I have a hundred thousand dollar bond, let's say I sell it for a hundred and ten thousand, for example, I sold it at a premium. The market says it's worth a hundred. I sold it for 110. I sold it at a premium. I'm going to compute the interest using the straight line method for a premium. A premium. So, uh, in this case, I sold a thousand dollar bond for 103,600 dollars. That's 103.6 percent of the par value. Sold this bond at a 12% interest rate. Market interest rate's 10%. It means I sold it at a premium. Just as before, I make four total interest payments every uh, one every six months for a period of two years. So first we record the cash that we're receiving from the sale of the bond at a premium. A debit cash, $103,600. We got to that amount, take the face value times the percent that we sold it at, 3.6%. Now you'll notice there's a new account. It's called the premium on bonds payable. This is again a contra account, contra liability account. Another word for contra is adjunct. Yeah. So it's a contra liability account because there's a premium. Instead of debiting it, we credit. Okay, a premium on bonds payable typically. Holds a credit balance, typically gets credited. Because he sold it at a premium, obviously that has to be paid back. So we credit. It's a liability account. And then, of course, we credit bonds payable at its face value, 100000 The bond is hundred thousand. The premium is three thousand six hundred, giving us total value of the bond of one hundred three thousand six hundred. Our debit cash three thousand six hundred. I credited the bonds payable three thousand six hundred. I credited the bond hundred thousand. About the interest, we make interest payments every six months. Looking at its face value, 1000 times 12% interest is what we sold it at, times half a year, because we make the payment every six months, it's $6,000. Pay that four times over the life of the bond. 
So 6,000 times 4 is 24,000. Minus the premium paid, 3,600, gives us a total bond interest expense of 20,400. Divide that by four payments. That means I pay interest every six months of $5,100. Payment goes like this. $5,100 debit to bond interest expense to show the interest expense. I debit the premium on the bonds payable. What's that? What that's doing is it's reducing that premium on bonds payable account until it reaches zero at the end of the bond's useful life, you see. Which means I've made a total cash payment of $6,000. Everyone sees how we got there. Now it's complex. It's like probably the most complex chapter, honestly. And to show that we eventually return to that face value at the end of the bond's useful life, we see how the premium rate reduces down to zero once the bond has been totally repaid. At, on the date of its maturity. That's why we call it straight line amortization. It's full as a straight line. When the bond is maturing, we go through a process what we call retiring the bond. So, at the end of the bond's useful life, at the end of it matures, we retire it. The way we do that is we debit bonds payable for the face value, and we credit cash for the face value to record the retirement of this bond. Sometimes, the company might decide to repay that bond before the maturity date. Okay, uh, it's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. When that happens, you know, oftentimes there's a premium that is paid to the bondholder for retiring the bond early. So if you hold a bond for a company and that company comes to you and says, hey, we're tired of paying you interest. We're, we want to pay you the whole thing and be done with this bond. You turn to them and say, great, you're going to pay me a premium on top of that. Because you're still going to get your all of your interest. That's, a, that's the idea behind uh, retiring a bond early. It's kind of like sometimes if you take out a loan, you pay that loan off early. Some banks might have what's called an a early repayment fee. Okay? Uh, that's because the bank's not going to get all the interest back when you repay the loan early. So they might charge a fee. This kind of works the same way. So we have a face value of $100,000. After the first interest payment, we're like, you know what? Uh, we don't need this bond. Let's just repay the whole thing. So we repay the hundred thousand, but we're going to also repay uh, uh, the the interest that the first interest payment, and uh, uh, a little premium, right? So we debit the bond hundred thousand. We debit premium on the bonds, $4,500. You'll notice that there's a new account called Gain on Bond Retirement. Because we paid the bond back early, we didn't have to pay all of the interest. But we still have to account for it. So the interest that we did not repay goes into an account called the Gain on Bond Retirement. That is another one of those Contra accounts. And we 
it normally holds a credit balance. So in this case, $1,500 goes to that. Only credit cash, $103,000 to satisfy the bond, and then we retire it. If you're ever in a position where you have the opportunity to repay a loan before it's due, there's no fees involved for doing that, I recommend that you do it. Okay, having debt around is not a wise idea from a personal finance perspective. For business, sometimes the business needs that loan in order to operate. But in any situation, whether it's the business or whether it's you personally, I strongly recommend you pay it back early. Sometimes even with the fee, you end up saving in the long run, not having to pay that additional interest. Just something to think about. There is uh, sometimes conversion. This is where a company might decide to convert a bond into shares of stock. Call this a bond retirement conversion. You can convert a bond into stock. Stock, remember, represents shares of ownership in the company. A bond does not. So there's some benefit on behalf of the bondholder here by converting it into stock. Sometimes there's a benefit to the company as well because it saves them on that interest payment. We have an example of this type of conversion happening. $1,000 face value uh, converted into 15,000 shares of common stock at $2 per share. The rest goes to an account called paid in capital in excess of par value. That's how it works. We debit bonds payable for the face value. We credit common stock. How do we figure out how much to credit common stock? We converted the bond to common stock, 15,000 shares at $2 per share. 15 times 2 is 30. So $30,000 goes into common stock, which is an equity account, for those of you keeping track. The Paid in capital in excess of par is 70000 How do we get 70000 We took the bond face value minus the common stock. So we got 70000 It's paid in capital in excess of par because it's the remaining balance above the $2 per share. Yeah. It's kind of like saying, eh, we'll give you some cash. And some shares of stock instead of that that bond. This is similar. It's very similar. <clears throat> Another long term liability that we oftentimes talk about in accounting are loans, also known as notes. Long term notes payable. A note payable is a loan. It's straightforward. It's a loan. You might have a note payable to your bank for your mortgage or for your car payment. Those are long-term notes payable for the company. Yeah. company. The company might have a mortgage. The company might have other assets that it financed from the bank. We do that through notes payable. It's a, basically a loan for the company. They're long-term because they're greater than a year. The company receives cash from the bank when it takes out a loan. Or the company pays cash to the bank because it financed an asset, like a 
a building or a vehicle or a machinery, etc. Anytime there's a repayment of principal and interest being made, call it a notes payable. A couple of key things, uh, information you, you need to know. The date the note was issued, the loan started. The maturity date of the loan, when the face value needs to be paid back. Of course, the interest rate and how long the loan is for. Those are the key factors you need to know. Some loans might just be one payment. Try a loan for two years, interest rate 10%, face value 100000 I'm going to pay the entire 100000 plus all of the interest in one single payment. It happens. It looks like this. The cash comes out of the company for principal plus interest. On the date of which the loan is due. Date of maturity. Most loans require regular monthly payments of principal plus interest. I make the same mortgage payment every month on the first of the month for a long time. <laughs> right? I pay my card the same time every single month, the same amount. Regular payments of principal plus interest. Is how most loans are structured. We look at things like the date the loan started, when the total loan is due, the interest rate, and the principal amount. We make the same payment every single month. That's what this represents. We have an example. <clears throat> January 1, the company borrowed $60,000 from a bank to purchase some equipment. The interest rate is 8% and requires three payments per year plus interest. Okay, it's a three-year loan. It's a three-year loan for three payments. I make one payment per year for three years, in other words. Once I receive the cash, so I debit cash, 60000 Credit notes payable, 60000 You'll notice the note. It says I borrowed 60000 8% for three years. Great. Now i got to figure out how much the interest is going to be. It's not always straightforward. We use what's called present value. Present value is a concept that we use to calculate things like interest and the total payment. You might use either a present value table or a financial calculator to help you to calculate present value. The idea here is to show, to demonstrate the principle called the time value of money. You may have heard that a dollar today is worth more than a dollar tomorrow. Why is that? You can tell me, why would a dollar today be worth more than a dollar tomorrow? Of inflation, it's part of it. <laughs> it's part of it, Damon. It's a big part of it, yeah. So inflation, yeah, that's a, that's yeah. I, I, at least today, that's true. Yes, but let's take 
let's take inflation out of the equation. Would a dollar today be more more than a dollar tomorrow? Other than inflation. Let's pretend there's no inflation. Yeah, that is different if you say it's worth more today than it is tomorrow, vice versa. Yeah, you're on the right track of thinking. So here's what I... Go ahead. Is it the interest? Yes, it's the interest. That's That's one of the primary factors. The other reason why is because I can take that dollar and invest it today. When I invest it today, I get the interest rate today. Okay, if I put that dollar into a bank account and that bank account yields 3% interest, I get three cents on that dollar uh, every year but it's, or every month. And it uses this concept called compounding interest. Compounding interest is where I earn interest on top of my interest. So that dollar that I invested at the beginning of this month, at the end of the month, that's worth a dollar and three cents. At the beginning of next month, it's a dollar and three cents. At the end of next month, it's worth a dollar and six cents. You see? Or I'm sorry, it's worth a dollar and eight cents. Reason why dollar eight instead of a dollar six, because I earn interest on the dollar and three that's there at the beginning of the month, and then the following month it's worth a dollar twelve. The following month it's worth a dollar fifteen. You see, it goes up exponentially because I left the principal plus the interest in the account. That's the idea of compounding interest. <laughs> It's where you earn interest on top of interest. Guarantee you have it. Uh, kind of. It depends. So guarantees are always a little, a little interesting. Uh, okay. So we use this concept called time value of money is what I'm getting at. The, the, the dollar today is worth more than a dollar tomorrow because I can invest that dollar. That dollar will, will earn me interest. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's the, or I can invest that dollar today, or I can use that dollar today. It's still worth more than a dollar tomorrow. Uh, great. So, so that's, that's the general concept behind it. Um, most loans require regular monthly payments. In order for us to figure out what that regular monthly payment is, we've got to figure out what the interest rate is. Once so we know the interest rate, we can calculate the monthly payment. The monthly, Because remember, we have to pay principal plus interest back. Right? So using our example, $60,000 loan at 8% interest, can figure out that my interest uh, on a $60,000 loan is 8%. I can look at the present value factor for 8% and figure out that uh, it's (laughs) 2.5771 using this table, right? It's just a matter of... a dollar amount, what's the interest amount, to find the factor, right? Based off of 60,000 divided by 2.5771, uh, that means I'm going to have a yield of $23,282. $23,282 is the amount of interest plus face value that I would repay each year. You'll notice, looking at this chart, this this chart graph, whatever, uh, well, it's technically both. 
<clears throat> you, you see that the interest rate uh, is going down with every payment that I'm making, and the principal balance is getting bigger. I pay more interest than principal by the end of the life of the loan. A lot of loans are structured this way. Uh, so that's why it's important to know this, right? Uh, it's important to know that when before you take out a loan, you want to run what we call the present value factor on that loan in order to know how much you're going to have to repay every single month equal payments until we reach the end of the life of the loan. You'll also notice that at the end of the three years, I've paid a total interest amount of $9,846. That's what 8% represents. So that means I would have paid a total of $69,846 at the end of the useful life of the loan. So it's important to see this concept because uh, you might be faced with taking out a loan at some point, and it's important to know how to calculate it. These are the uh, journal entries that I would make. <clears throat> so the first payment I made uh, to the bank looks like this. I debit the interest expense, 4800 I debit notes payable, 18,008, uh, sorry, 18,482. And I record the cash payment, 23,232, uh, sorry. Um, and that is, that represents the total payment that I've made for the end of the, that first year. End of the second year, or uh, yeah, end of the second year, debit interest expense 3,321, debit notes payable 19,961, net credit cash 23,282. So this kind of represents the, the journal honorees that we make. Based off of that uh, that last slide that showed us the uh, the the annuity table, right? Um, schedule, That's good. amortization schedule. Mortgages work the same exact way. Uh, it's very very typical of a mortgage amortization schedule to to um, to be. Broken out that same way. As you know, a mortgage uh, is a legal agreement between the buyer, uh, the buyer, the homeowner, and the bank that the loan is with. Which is the legal document that governs that loan. Uh, if you don't pay it back, the bank can take the house because that's what the mortgage is. It's a bond. It's a Form of a bond, actually. Uh, so that's the concept behind the mortgage. There are a lot of different kinds of debt that uh, are out there at the disposal of companies and individuals. There's what we call secured debt and unsecured debt. Secured debt is where there's an asset associated with the debt. An example of that is a mortgage. It's secured by the house. The house is the collateral for the mortgage. Therefore, it's secured. If I don't repay the mortgage, the bank can come take the house. It's a secured loan. It's secured by the house. The bank is securing that loan using the house as collateral. <clears throat> Unsecured debt. Example of that would be a credit card. There's no asset behind it. If I don't repay the credit card, so what? The bank sues me. But there's nothing behind, there's nothing securing that credit card. If you don't repay the credit card, they're not going to come take the house. 
credit card's not backed by anything. It's unsecured. So unsecured debt would be things like a credit card or a payday loan, if you will. A convertible bond or a loan where we can convert the debt from a bond to uh, box, convertible, and change it. No bond or a loan is callable. That means I can collect the full face value at any time. Callable. If I feel that I'm not getting repaid fast enough, I can. All you on that loan, you have to pay the whole thing right away. It's callable. A bond or note can be what we call term and serial. Term represents the amount of time to repay. Okay, two years, that's the term. Serial means I could, you could make serial payments, same amount, same time every month. That's what we call serial payments. It's a series of payments. Yeah. Serial. Registered and bearer. Registered being signed. Bearer the holder. Yeah. These are the terms that we use. A couple of ratios that a company would want to know before they decide to take out a loan. One of the most important ones is called the debt-to-equity ratio. The debt-to-equity ratio tells the company, investors, the risk when it comes to taking out additional debt. If the debt-to-equity ratio is... Uh, one or greater than one that is really really bad <laughs> that means they have more liabilities than they have equity yeah and less than one is considered to be acceptable the way it's calculated is we take total liabilities and we divide that by total equity both of these are found on your balance sheet This also works the same way for the bank, right? Let's say you, you're looking to a um, mortgage. One thing that the bank will probably do is they'll run the debt-to-equity ratio on you. They'll take your total liabilities, everything that you own. I'm sorry, everything that you owe. Total liabilities, everything that you owe. Divide that by your total equity. Equity is assets minus liabilities. That's how you can do your debt to equity ratio on yourself. It tells the riskiness of the ability to repay the loan to the bank. <clears throat> Bonds are very interesting vehicles because. Uh, we, we repay the bond, the life of the bond. We simply pay interest payments. Then we pay the full face value at the end of the bond. Uh, it is both good and bad. It's good because it's predictable. It's not the best because at the end of that bond, there's a huge payment involved. We call that a balloon payment. And pay a big amount at the end of the loan or at the end of the bond. We talked about the idea of uh, bond discount. Sometimes you won't have all of the information in front of you. So there will be a question. Like they'll say, find the issuance price. 
of a discount bond. Here's the information. It's we got a hundred thousand dollar bond, and it has stated interest rate of eight percent, and the market interest rate is ten percent. Okay, you can already see that it's a discount because the stated interest rate is lower than the market value. So it's being sold at a discount. How much of a discount? That's what we want to know. What's it going to be sold at? You can figure this out. We can see uh, that the interest rate was 8%. We can see that it's repaid uh, a year, twice per year over a period of two years. We know that the market rate is 10%. We sold it at 8%. Mark, we t first thing we do is we figure out what is the semi-annual rate. We take the market rate and divide that by 2, 5%. We figure out how many payments. Those four payments, two years, twice per year. Now that we have these two pieces of information, Use our present value table using a 5% market semi-annual market rate for four periods. Find the present value factors. The present value factor, multiply that by the face value, get the present value of the bond. Get the interest, we take the interest payment. $4,000 times the present value factor 5% gets us to $14,182 total interest payments for the life of the bond. That means that the discount bond amount is going to be $96,454. Present value factors are found on an annuity table using the interest rate, number of payments. Number of payments is going to be on the um, horizontal excess, and the uh, interest rate is going to be on the vertical axis. We're looking at one of these kinds of tables. Do the same thing on a premium of a bond. How can I find out what the price of the bond was? Face value times interest rate times the time. And then I use the same concept looking at that present value factor table. Almost done. Computer recording amortization of the bond using the effective interest method. Went, we went through this through this example earlier, but just to kind of recap with you. Excel is a wonderful tool in order to figure this a lot of this kind of stuff out because Excel has the ability to do the present value factors and all that fun stuff. Uh, and this is kind of what what it looks like from from that perspective using Excel. One of the last things I want to talk about is uh, leases and pensions. A lease is an agreement between the leaser, the owner of the asset, and the leasee, the person renting the asset. The most common example is you rent an apartment. The leaser is the apartment owner. The leasee is, is you, is me running the apartment in exchange for cash payments over time. A finance lease is a little bit different. This example is more geared toward you leased a car. Call it a finance lease. The reason why it's a finance lease is because they still build in um, interest. 
into the lease. Still a portion of principal payment in that lease. That's why at the end of the auto lease, you have the option to buy it. It's usually at a much reduced uh, lease value amount. Right. So that's an example of finance lease. An operating lease gives you the ability uh, to, to use the asset for a period of time. It includes things like apartment, an operating lease. You don't have the same requirements as a finance lease does. Pensions, a pension is a form of uh, retirement benefit that's defined by the employer. The employer might make a contribution to your retirement based off of the amount of time that you work there. When you reach retirement age, yourself with a pension, you'll receive an annuity payment on that pension over time. That, friends, is our end of our discussion on long-term liabilities. Are there any comments, questions, or concerns about long-term liabilities that I did not cover that you need a little bit more clarity on? Anything at all? I do okay. Is it mostly straightforward? <laughs> so it was straightforward. Okay. Awesome. Very cool. Uh, the the uh, the homework, the the quiz. It's it's not that bad, I promise. Okay. It's just like just like normal. It's a couple couple questions. You got the two attempts. If you need to try to get, try to get. Okay. Uh, there's nothing wrong with that. The higher the two grades is accepted as always. So that's due on Sunday night. Next week. Very busy week. It's the last week of the course. So we got two chapters to get through. We got 15 and 16. I know it sounds like a lot. It's not that bad. 16 is real short. 15 is to some extent as well. I promise you we'll get through it. Uh, it's It won't be that bad. Um, so my recommendation, try to work ahead. That way it takes a little stress off of you. For next week. Okay. Because remember, 15 and 16, those are both due on Saturday. Not this coming, but the following Saturday, the 29th. So just prepare for that. Think about working a little bit ahead so that way you don't get stressed out. I don't want you to feel stressed. Okay? You got enough to deal with. <laughs> so, uh, and then uh, we'll I'll also provide you with an overview video the final exam. Yeah, I'll have to help you out as much as I can. Everything's open now, so you're more than welcome to, to work ahead. Uh, and as uh, Maxine Mills talked about earlier, it's, uh, it's, not, it's not that bad. It's just, it's a process. And uh, working ahead, there's nothing wrong with that. So you're more than welcome to do it. In fact, I encourage it. And if for whatever reason you still owe something, please make sure you get that done as soon as possible. Because the clock's ticking. And when we reach the 29th, that's it. I can't accept anything else. You see? So, if you need anything, you can email me, call me, set up office hours. I'm always here for you. Okay? Oh, and also, real fast, if you're interested, I am teaching Principles of Accounting 2 during the summer. I know, oh, Dr. B, during the summer, I don't like to take classes in the summer. It's okay. Recommend it, though. Because principles, too, it's very straightforward. Very straightforward. It's a little shorter than principles one is. It's designed that way, okay? I'm teaching that course, principles of accounting, too, the second half of the summer. I think it starts at June something, July something, June something, and it goes till uh, middle of August. It's six weeks. 
a lot to get through in six weeks, but it's not that bad, I promise. It's going to be on campus. So if you want to hang out with me, I think it's on Monday nights, six weeks for three and a half hours a night, you're more than welcome to. So please register early for your, your classes for the fall and for the summer. They, they will fill up relatively quick. So if you have any need to help, have questions about that, just send me a quick email. I'll help you out. But thank you all so much for your time today. Appreciate every single one of you. Keep up the hard work. Wish you all the best. And I'll see you all again next week. Same time, same channel. Thank you so much. Appreciate all of you. Take care. Bye.